Uh, well, the first speaker is Sergeant Anthony Mendez. Sergeant Anthony Mendez is a 20-year veteran of the Delaware State Police. Sergeant Mendez was certified in collision reconstruction and began his current position as vehicular homicide detective in 2006. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant in 2010. Uh, and assumed command of the Sussex County Delaware Collision Reconstruction Unit. Sergeant Mendez was recognized as an expert in collision reconstruction uh, in 2008 by the Superior Court during multiple victim vehicular uh, homicide trial. Um, he's going to speak, and then we have um, D.A. McCormick, and then I'm going to speak a little bit, then we'll open it up um, for some discussion. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Sergeant Mendez. I, uh, I became acquainted with uh, Jennifer Smith last year at the Lifesavers Conference in uh, Colorado. I, I, uh, I put together a presentation which was given to some troopers in Delaware to uh, enhance their ability to go out and enforce the distracted driving laws, laws much similar to the, uh, the site vehicles and the Tahoes and things of that nature, how to effectively use marked cars and unmarked cars to go out and aggressively uh, enforce the distracted driving laws. Now. At the end of that presentation, I, I had put together some information regarding the best practices for investigating fatalities involving distracted driving. And the last part of the segment was what uh, Ms. Smith kind of caught on to. And she was liking what she was seeing as far as some of the ideas I had to give detectives, primarily collision reconstruction detectives, of what they could do to better their investigations to get to a successful conclusion uh, in trial, which is ultimately going to be what Mr. McCormick gets to when, when, uh, when he presents here momentarily. Now, in Delaware, uh, and as it sounds much like in New York, there is a threshold that you have to gap and one of them is negligence versus criminal negligence and as a traffic homicide investigator we have to attempt or we have to do our best to get from mere negligence which may be riding down the road sending a text message a single text message to then having a crash occur and then determining that that person may have sent multiple text messages or perhaps access Facebook Twitter uh, Instagram and, and things of that of that nature or snapchat things like that and it all starts from the beginning uh, of, the, of the investigation from the time the detective gets called out and I, I kind of wanted to start the presentation with a newspaper clipping that I found uh, just before I put this together before the initial snow out in February and I, I found it very interesting uh, and this was from a, a, a professor out of a university in Philadelphia and he mentioned that there was a study completed and, and you guys have been bombarded with statistics but there was a study completed with 34,000 teenagers that basically determined that 100 percent of them were distracted at some point in time during the day at their commute in college whether it was driving whether it was on the sidewalk uh, whether it was basically just going to and fro. And then the article actually kind of goes right into what I'm trying to, to explain. And the author of this, Mr. Uh, Jim Mayhar, said that after a car accident, a driver or a cell phone user will lie to police in front of their children to cover up their conduct to, uh, to lessen the effect of the crash or the ticket the summons are getting ready to get. And then it kind of goes into crash investigation as to after it gets determined that a crash has happened and they're still trying to cover it up, you know, what the investigators have to then do to get the investigation to the next level. And uh, the overview of what I'm about ready to explain is it's going to start with crashes that are predominantly uh, the result of distracted driving. As a traffic homicide investigator, years and years ago, when I would arrive on a scene or when I would get called out to a scene, some of the things that initially go through your mind are, are DUI, alcohol. Uh, you know, then then you, we kind of went through the hash, we went through the crack cocaine, we we went to heroin, and then we kind of went away from some of those things. And then prescription drugs came in, your Xanax, your Oxycontin, and things of that nature. And then heroin kind of came back. And now, we still think of those things predominantly. However, cell phone usage is way up there. I'll give you an example. I, I, I get called out to a crash at 2 in the morning, and I try to start right from the get-go. Uh, you take the call, what kind of crash is it? T-bone, intersection, red light, stop sign, 
something of that nature. One of the first questions I asked the, the sergeant that, that's calling me out is, is, I need you to transfer me to the on-scene trooper. I need to speak with that officer so I can kind of find out what I'm getting into before I get there. Now, I want to find out some things, what type of crash it is, is the driver, the person at fault, critically injured, and where is his phone. It's much easier if I start my investigation from the beginning with that in mind. Where is the cell phone? Is it in the debris field? Is it in the wreckage? Has it accompanied him to the hospital, he or she to the hospital, which is something I'll touch on here too. Uh, and also, regarding the phone, we're also building the investigation to solidify the criminal or the negligence, pushing it to criminal negligence. And some of the other ways that we do that are through our examination at the crash scene, what we find and a lot of times what we don't find at crash scenes, uh, which can indicate distracted driving, and also cell phone recovery, which I briefly touched on. I'm also going to talk a little bit about cell phone records, which are not the end-all, be-all of, of a vehicle homicide investigation involving text messaging. It can be very difficult at times to put together an entire investigation based on cell phone records. Uh, and also, I'm going to kind of get into a forensic imaging of cell phones, which is a new tactic that we have started using in Delaware, which is very useful for getting texting data, uh, web usage, uh, chats, instant messages, Instagram, Twitter, things of that nature, to determine if that's actually being used when a crash happens. Uh, and I'm also going to kind of push it in another direction when we're trying to get to that criminal negligence. There's other technology in the vehicle that we use which can also get us there. And uh, the airbag control module in the car, uh, which is basically uh, keeping track of multiple things that when the car is going down the road, your vehicle throttle percentage, your, acceler your, your speed, your, uh, uh, your braking, whether or not you're wearing your seatbelt, your headlights, uh, engine uh, fault codes, things of that nature. We can use, also use that to perhaps solidify distracted driving or even rule out some other things like when somebody lies to you and says they fell asleep. How we can then perhaps use that information to kind of push that falling asleep uh, thing aside and then bring in, okay, well, you weren't falling asleep because we have positive steering angle four seconds prior to impact. Uh, and then one second before impact we have negative steering, which is you reacting to that as you're approaching the crash scene. Um, and I'll kind of summarize by putting all this together for search warrants for officers, some techniques and some things they can put in their search warrants to get them through the magistrates, get them approved by different judges, uh, to push your, your negligence investigation up to the criminal negligence. Now, crash scenes that I have here that you're about to see, they are fatalities that either myself or three of the detectives that uh, were co-workers have investigated over the course of the last five or six years. And they're crashes that are predominantly, uh, from my experience and from their experience, resulted to distracted driving. Your high-speed rear end, and when you have your high-speed rear end, you're typically not going to have any pre-impact braking. Uh, you're going to have perhaps witness testimony that the vehicle went off the road at a high, high rate of speed. There was no steering input uh, to the left or right, and basically they hit a stationary object and came to rest. Uh, now, with those types of things, we're able to then download these cars and actually determine there was no braking or there was no steering. And, and that's something that we're able to then put in later on to push it to the criminally negligent uh, level of the investigation. Your head-ons, uh, also your failure to maintain lanes are predominantly, from my experience, and now there's other, there's other factors involved, you know, it could be alcohol or intoxication, uh, maybe a medical event or something along those lines, but your head-on crashes are also considered predominantly the result of distracted driving. Uh, your failure to maintain lane, and I mentioned this earlier, and I'll kind of go into, uh, if we have some investigators here, I know there's some troopers in the back, some other law enforcement officials. When you get to these crash scenes as an investigator, you're looking for evidence that is going to solidify your idea that distracted driving was a factor. With this particular crash that you have in front of you, you have a, a multiple victim fatality head on into a tree, and you notice at the bottom behind the rear bumper of this uh, Toyota that there is no pre-impact braking, uh, there's no scuffing, there's no furrowing, there's no disturbance to any of the foliage or the leaves. We have a vehicle that just simply drives off the road, goes head on into a tree, 
uh, which was then solidified by the witness that was directly behind him that then gave us the information that not only did it drive off the road head on into a tree, which resulted into the death, resulted in the death of the driver and passenger, but also, uh, and before the crash, would go, was, was accelerating, decelerating, crossed the center line uh, prior to doing this. Now, additionally, you have your stale red lights and your stop sign runs. These are crashes that are also predominantly the result of distracted driving. Uh, what we have here is a, is a T-bone crash where uh, actually when I assisted the medical examiner loading this female victim into the, uh, into the, the wagon, the morgue wagon, we actually had to peel the phone uh, from her hand, the, her fingers off the phone. Uh, basically we have a van that you see at the top coming from your right to the left. Van's required to stop. The pickup truck that's off to the top left is going from uh, down to up. He has the right of way. She completely runs the stop sign through the stop bar, takes it in the driver's door. She's deceased on scene. Some of the things we look for from, from a collision reconstruction uh, angle uh, is, was there any evidence to suggest that there was distraction on both parts? Well, with this particular wreck, we have the pre-impact braking on behalf of the person that wasn't at fault. So we know that he was in fact paying attention and saw this white van coming across from right to left, tried to avoid, was unable to. Uh, now, I'm going to kind of go into uh, cell phone recovery a little bit because this can be a little bit tricky. Uh, getting the investigation from just basically sending a text message to pushing it to the point where they were excessively using it. Well, the first thing we got to do is, is actually get a hold of the phone. Now, as an investigator, one of the best tools you're going to have is while you're en route, you got to get a hold of that first responding trooper, or perhaps if you have a state police helicopter that's transporting your victim, get a radio call to them determine if the phone is in possession of your victim or your suspect depending on uh, the angle of the investigation. You need to get a hold of that phone and you need to get a hold of it immediately and get it powered down. And the reason you got to get it powered down is a lot of times there's, there's certain apps, some that are more prevalent than others, where a phone can be wiped. And it, they're actually not bad apps. They're, they're not intentionally bad apps. You know, say your cell phone gets stolen, you don't want somebody having all your pictures, your, your personal information. There's apps where you can wipe your phone, but, but that's detrimental to law enforcement while we're investigating crashes. So we need to get that phone power down, and it's better that I can do that before I get there if they're able to locate the phone. Uh, so that's one step of the investigation that I don't need to be concerned about. Now, if the crash mechanism is high, meaning you have a high impact crash, uh, and distracted driving is likely, uh, there is a great probability of locating the phone in the, record, in the wreckage of the actual crash itself, and I'll have some photos here in a moment of that. Now, you, gotta, you have to keep in mind that if the crash mechanism is high, meaning that you have high speeds, you have fatal injuries or critical injuries, most likely the phone has not accompanied that driver to the hospital it's in the wreckage of the car because you have airbag interaction, you have crash forces, you have operator kinematics with people moving around inside the vehicles and such, where that phone is probably not going to be on that person's body as it leaves the scene. Uh, if you're there, you need to section the vehicle, be very precise, perhaps even a terrain search of the area of the crash, of the, of the point of impact, of your, of your post-impact angles. You need to focus on where that vehicle went after impact and you're likely to possibly find the phone not in the vehicle or outside of the vehicle if all the windows and such have been shattered. Now, the, uh, the use of, uh, and I mentioned this, if we have any re reconstructionists in, in here in the, in the room, the crash forces that uh, the human body undergoes during a crash and, and the direction where you might think a vehicle or a, a cell phone is located probably is not going to be helpful. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is you know, you have a left to right impact or a frontal impact. Things are going to ricochet around in the car and you may think the phone is going to be somewhere in the front floor, but actually it ends up being in the back, perhaps even in the rear glass area or something along those lines. You cannot base, you know, it's not helpful to determine which way that person went or the direction of force, the principal direction of force in determining where the phone may be located. Um, one thing that I found helpful is if I can't find a phone at a crash scene, 
uh, I'll actually have the barracks uh, I'll call that person's number. If I have a witness there or a passenger and I'm able to obtain that person's phone number, I will able actually call the phone, have the barracks call the phone, and if that phone is still operable and it's not completely damaged, there's a good chance you're going to hear it ringing somewhere around the crash scene, uh, and then you're much more able to find it, uh, it compared to actually having to dig through a lot of debris, vehicle parts, kitty litter, things of that nature that you might find along the roadside. Um, Another thing, and this was something that I, I believe Mr. Lieberman is going to touch on, if a cell phone accompanies, if you can't find a cell phone, and the cell phone hasn't accompanied your suspect driver to the hospital, when that vehicle gets towed, you need to make sure that the tow company is very active. They tow the vehicle with care, they cover it both to and fro, the tow yard, the tow yard secure, and the vehicle gets covered with a tarp. Because as myself or one of my detectives will do the vehicle inspection along with a certified mechanic uh, the following day or two, we'll still be able to perhaps find that cell phone if maybe it's under the carpet or, or it's in, a, in an air duct or, or something or it's embedded in the dashboard or something like that. There's a good chance we might be able to recover that phone the following day if the tow yard, if they get, they get it covered and make sure that the weather and the elements don't affect that phone. Um, the photos we have here from a head-on collision, and, and I, I just wanted to, just to let everybody in the room know just how difficult it can be to find a cell phone. Uh, with this particular head-on, it was about a month and a half ago. The vehicle on the left, the, the van that has the roof cut off of it, was actually our suspect vehicle, um, and I believe that he was texting at the time. Uh, I don't have all the records back at this point, but as I was scouring the wreckage, I was able to find the phone, which I circled in red. It was actually on the ground outside of the vehicle uh, in the area of that ball joint tie rod that, you sh that you're looking at uh, that's down on the ground. Um, and another important thing that I want you to notice on this particular cell phone is cell phone damage can be indicative of the type of crash, uh, not the type of crash, but it's, a, it's an indicator if it was in the person's hand when the crash occurred. I, I know a lot of you folks in here have probably damaged your iPhone or your droid and you dropped it on the ground and you get a spider web kind of crack that goes across the screen. It's kind of a lazy forming crack from one end to the other. You can probably still use it, even slide your finger across it. But if a cell phone, especially a smartphone, has interaction with an airbag, you'll typically have a, a, a lot of shattering right around the top frame because if it's in the person's right or left hand, typically the airbag's gonna detonate about 180 to 200 miles an hour, push back then shove the phone back into the driver, the top of the cell phone, which may have actually some talc powder from the, from the airbag being uh, packed, is a good indicator that it was in the person's phone when the, uh, when the crash occurred, and also some biological evidence. The second photos, as far as locating cell phones, sometimes it can be difficult, sometimes it can be easy. This particular Corvette, which we had uh, at 109 miles an hour before we hit a tree and killed the driver, we found the cell phone on the front seat still connected to the charger. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. The, uh, the cell phone recovery, and I want to specifically mention this to crash detectives or maybe troopers that are going to go to the hospital. Um, we need to once again get a hold of the cell phone. Uh, now, in my experience, most drivers that are involved in crashes uh, have not considered the possibility that law enforcement are going to seize their phone. And the, the idea that they need to spoil data or delete data is not forthright in their mind, which we're still kind of lucky about. That could change as time goes by. Uh, but time is of the essence. And when I mean time is of the essence, we need to make sure that an officer accompanies or responds to the hospital in a timely manner to either uh, when the helicopter arrives or when, when the ground transport arrives uh, to then keep track of that phone if the phone is on that person's or if the clothes get cut off of that person to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the phone because if any family member is allowed in that room when that person's being treated there is a chance that you could have evidence contamination and, and perhaps even a deliberate removal of, of evidence because people are getting smart to the fact I mean a mother or father that goes into the hospital knows that their father or son, or I'm sorry, their son or daughter is a busybody on their phone, they're constantly texting, things of that nature. You never know, a parent could think, well, this phone is in here, let me get rid of it before the police get here, because it, it's, once the cell phone uh, is not around anymore, it makes things a lot more difficult, because then we're relying on cell phone records, and, and they're not the greatest thing to prosecute a case with. Um, 
Now, if the person is uncooperative at the hospital, meaning they do not want to turn their phone over to you, um, I, I have some suggestions listed here, and, and they're all and they're all based on your department's policy and and, and the Constitution. We don't want to violate anybody's rights, um, but basically, we want to maintain an officer's presence uh, and make sure they don't use the phone uh, and for two reasons. You don't want any data added if you can avoid it, and you don't want any data deleted. Um, and we need to make sure that the investigator, and, and I suggest having a search warrant template on your in-car computer that just needs a few things put in it, like the date and time of the crash, the location, the circumstances, so you can then formulate this search warrant in a timely manner so you can get it sent or emailed to a magistrate and then perhaps go in front of a video phone or, or maybe even like a video chat kind of thing where you can then see the judge, he sees you, and you can then get this warrant signed and maybe faxed to the ER and get it there very quickly so then you can then take possession of that. Now, the search warrant, if the person starts to, to delete that or use the phone, then my suggestion would be you would just go into an exigent kind of circumstance and you would forcibly remove the phone from the person and then you give them the search warrant later on. And, and I believe that under the rules of evidence, persons destroying the evidence, you can make, uh, you can make every effort to retain that. And then you just, you're just you going to go back and backtrack with a search warrant later on. Um, but once again, I just want to make sure that whatever your department's policies are, we need to make sure that we follow those regarding tampering with evidence. Um, damaged cell phones. Someone might think that, OK, well, this iPhone are destroyed, or this flip phone. Uh, it is completely damaged and it can't be imaged or it's of no use. But what the damage does is it can kind of tell us once again if, the, if it was in the person's hand when the crash occurred. And typically the older style flip phones, I don't see them around too much anymore. Uh, typically you're older. I know my mother who's, uh, who's 70 years old, actually 80 years old, uh, still uses a flip phone. And she's probably the only one of my family that still has a flip phone. Everybody else has graduated to a smartphone, and with a smartphone comes a lot more issues. And, uh, but as far as damage is concerned, the smartphones have shattered screens, which I mentioned earlier, typically towards the top of the frame. Uh, and you may have the airbag powder uh, that's embedded in the shattered areas. And another very important issue that I've seen with some cell phones is I've had blood and skin that are embedded in the, the, the shattered, cracked areas uh, that are a strong indicator that a person's fingers uh, were on the phone or even perhaps the phone was pressed between uh, the person's face and the airbag. And, and you, may, you may be able actually to determine that because your airbag injuries, it, uh, I know there's a lot of doctors in here, but just from a, from a police investigator's perspective, an airbag deployment injury is typically causes a red abrasion or a rash. Um, and as you go in with your, with your digital cameras, if you have injuries that are consistent with a cell phone against somebody's face or against somebody's chest, you can actually match that, that, those injuries up with the style of cell phone the person has, meaning if they have a, a, a rectangular mark on their right cheek as a result of the, of the airbag crushing the phone against them, that's very good evidence to have to show that that person was on the phone. Now. I'm going to go into cell phone records and some of the reasons why they uh, uh, why they're good and, and why they're not so good. And a lot of it has to do with uh, the amount of time, from my experience, the time it takes to get them back. Um, and as far as uh, if I. It's much easier to establish during the initial stages of the investigation uh, and, cre and can create lengthy delays uh, as far as the, the wrong carriers and so forth. When you're getting a cell phone record, you need to make sure that you have the correct cell phone number. And I find it much easier to get your cell phone number from your passengers that are riding with this person and then also family members at the hospital. Now, when I mean family members at the hospital, I'm typically letting them know that either a loved one has passed away or perhaps a loved one is a suspect in somebody else passing away. Um, but I do try to obtain that information before I fully let on the reason I'm asking for it. And, and sometimes the reason I say that is is that if they know that their, their loved one has caused someone else's death and a police officer is asking for a cell phone number and carrier, uh, they may start to put two and two together and it becomes a little more difficult. Now I find if, you know, when I'm talking to a mother or father and I say, you know, your, son, your son's been involved in a crash, um, 
can I get some information, date of birth, uh, address, employer, so forth. Does he have a cell phone? Yes. Do you mind telling me who the carrier is? That way I can get that information immediately and uh, I'm not trying to backtrack later on. There are, some, uh, there are some other aids that we have in law enforcement to determine who the carrier is. Um, there's some websites, phonefinder.com, we use that quite frequently. Uh, and the phone finder, you can enter the person's phone number and the last known carrier will in fact come up um, and you're, you're able to get some information that way. Now, um, and there's another, there's another way that, that we have that I, that I begin using which carrier it is. You can actually, if, if, if you know the phone number for the person who's driving this vehicle, you can send a text message to that phone and see whether or not he gets it or not. With the phone number, for example, with VText or with Sprint or with AT&T, you know, basically you follow the phone number with either VText.biz, messaging at SprintPCS.com, or the TXTATT, .net, and if that message arrives at that phone, basically you're kind of shooting messages out there to see which one finally hits on that person's phone. And then you're able to determine the cell phone carrier as to whether or not any of those messages actually reach that person's phone or not. And the reason we need to find that out is I I've had an investigation where you request cell phone records and you have the wrong carrier. And two or three weeks later, when the Department of Justice uh, issues you the cell phone records af after they receive them, and then I, I have somebody else's cell phone records that make no sense whatsoever, and then I have to go in and then try another two or three weeks to then get the proper cell phone records. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> one of the other things I wanted to mention was your cell phone uh, call logs. And this can go on to solidify your case if you're investigating a criminal, criminally negligent uh, vehicle homicide involving a cell phone. And you're able to establish uh, the area where the call was made, the, uh, the date and time the call was placed, uh, the duration of the call in seconds, and, and basically this is the least invasive type of search that we have. And uh, I'm able to get these cell phone records by simply calling, uh, if Mr. McCormick was a prosecutor in Delaware, I would get, call him on the phone. I would say, Mr. McCormick, I'm at a vehicle homicide case. Uh, I have no tire track evidence. I have a, a high-speed rear-end crash. Two people are dead. I suspect the person was on the cell phone. I found it in his possession. I have damage on the top, which is consistent with cell phone use. Can I get a subpoena for the cell phone records? And Mr. McCormick would then, he would say yay or nay, most likely yay. And he would issue yeah. definitely yeah. yeah. Definitely yeah. I got Tony calling me up. I'm just saying okay. <laughs> he will then sign a subpoena and I can uh, get those cell phone records just on Mr. McCormick's signature. And in other jurisdictions, it, that's not the case. I found out in certain areas uh, that type of information would have to go to a grand jury where the trooper or the detective would have to go in and present that evidence to the grand jury. The grand jury would then determine whether or not that's a good warrant. And then you have a, a time delay because those grand juries don't convene, uh, don't convene that frequently. Uh, texting logs. Texting logs are, now I'm, I'm not talking texting content, I'm just talking texting logs. In Delaware, I, I need a little bit more invasive of a search warrant, sort of like a wiretap almost, to get the actual texting content. Uh, however, I can get a texting log uh, issued to me, a texting log subpoena. The texting log just tells you that a text message was sent, who it was sent to, who received it. Uh, it gives you the phone number of the sender, the phone number of the receiver. And you can see in chronological order throughout the day or throughout the hour or the minutes the text message that came and went. Now that's very important uh, as far as the, the crash investigation is concerned because you can pretty much nail down very close when the crash occurs, especially if you have good witnesses. If you have good witnesses that called 911 immediately after the crash, you're able to then look at that witness's phone. Okay, 911 was called at a certain time. You get the cell phone records and sure enough, the time that the crash happened was, it was within seconds of multiple texting activity. That type of information can be helpful to then push that investigation from the negligence to the criminal negligence side. Uh, now, texting content, and I know I, I, there was a representative in here earlier that I met, I, I apologize, I don't remember his name, uh, but he was with AT&T, 
Now, some of this information that I have uh, is a little bit more focused towards Verizon. Uh, but currently, as I know it today, Verizon is the only carrier that we can still get texting content from. But it's very volatile. I need to get a, uh, I need to get a search warrant. I need to get a hold of uh, all the data and facts to support a search warrant, get it to a magistrate, and get it to Verizon within five days. Within five days, the information is gone. Um, now, other carriers, uh, it's much more volatile. And it's a lot of the times with other carriers, it's typically deleted as soon as the message is received. That doesn't mean we can't get it. And the next thing that I'm going to go into is the forensic uh, imaging of the, of the cell phones, which actually, in my opinion, is probably the best way to get the information from the cell phone. Uh, but if we go into some of the text messaging, the actual content of the text, what you see here is a, is a text sent by a female driver who killed her friend who was seated in the rear of her vehicle unrestrained. Her first text when she got back in her car was, I just got to my car. Now, what that tells us is the log, the message was sent at a certain time and its arrival and its final disposition. Uh, now, we then turn this into a log, and that helps prosecution, probably something that Mr. McCormick would like to see uh, because we're actually printing out in our own typing uh, the actual seconds, the minutes that the that the, uh, the texts were sent and the actual content. I, I blew out the numbers uh, for obvious reasons, but this particular case uh, was involving a female that was intoxicated, killed her friend from 3.15 in the morning at 35 seconds until 3.36 at 46 seconds. These were the activities that were going on in her car. And we were able to obtain these from the actual texting content records. Uh, just got to the car. Who's this? There's a little domestic uh, that went on between the two. Uh, she found out he had another girl at the house. Some cursing and sexual innu innuendos back and forth. Um, and then eventually she is rounding a curve at 93 miles an hour, which we were able to determine from an airbag download and a critical speed analysis. Uh, she ends up killing her friend. Now. We were able to push this case primarily because of the DUI, and that's disappointing, not just from texting, to the next level of criminally negligent homicide. She's serving 13 years uh, for killing her friend. Now, a lot of this had to do with the DUI and also an enhanced penalty uh, before her sentencing. She was on Facebook drinking at a local establishment that was captured by the victim's family that was brought to the prosecutor's attention. Uh, but these types of things are what's needed from officers to build your case uh, as far as your call logs are concerned and your texting logs. And this data can be obtained from your cell phone records, uh, your texting records. Now, the pictures that I have on the screen now is kind of the next new thing that we're using, the techniques that we're using. Uh, when I'm saying a forensic uh, analysis or an imaging of a cell phone, when we recover a cell phone and we want to determine the texting content, web page visited, instant uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. Uh, we're able to establish that through forensic imaging. The unit that, I, that, I, that I'm in command of, the Sussex Collision Reconstruction Unit, we, do, we don't do that ourselves. We forward the phone to our high-tech crimes unit that also handles all the, the child porn and the computer analysis and things of that nature. They take our phones uh, after we obtain a search warrant and they will, they will copy the data and they will preserve it and then they give it back to us. One of the things that's required is we have to provide a time frame. And the time frame that we have to provide is if the wreck happened at 10 a.m., uh, you know, we need to be as minimally invasive with time as we can, meaning 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. is probably the time that I'm going to want that information uh, so I can get a little bit of data before to find out what they were doing before the crash, and I can substantiate when the crash happened because obviously if it's a high mechanism crash, all the activity is going to stop. Now, and also, it, it eliminates some other headaches that you can get into later on. If you, if you ask for too much information, you might end up finding things on that phone that push the whole investigation in a different angle. Uh, uh, but when we do the search warrant, we get the data back from our high-tech crimes unit. Some of the things we have that we get are your chats, your, your texting, your instant messages, 
You get the person's contacts, their emails, data files, resources, thumbnails, you name it. Web pages visited, Facebook. Uh, over dinner last night, I was uh, with Ms. Smith. We were talking about Snapchat. Snapchat is the one of the newest things that's out now. And I was not personally familiar with the volatility of that data. So uh, this morning, I, I reached out to our, to our high tech crimes unit, and I had determined that they cannot get Snapchat off the phone. So currently Snapchat, which is an app I'm not greatly familiar with, however, the younger generation most likely is familiar with it, the text messages are gone immediately. Once they're sent, they're gone, they cannot be retrieved. Um, and even through the forensic analysis, it cannot be retrieved. Now, getting back to the search warrant, or I'm sorry, the forensic imaging, uh, the, cell, the search warrant is necessary, and if the phone is damaged, the good thing about it is we can rebuild it, or the high-tech crimes unit can rebuild the phone. They have parts and pieces of iPhones, um, droids, you name it. They can rebuild it, they can power it up, they can extract the data, they can remove the SIM card, do whatever they need to do to get the data from the phone and get it back to us, and actually a pretty timely manner. Now, password-protected phones, if you're wondering about password-protected phones, currently, they can break into any phone. Well, I don't mean break into a phone. I mean access a phone. That's probably the wrong word to use. After they have a search warrant, they can they can access the data on the phone, uh, even if it's password protected, with the exception of the new Apple iPhone. Now, I'm told the new Apple iPhone. What they do with the new Apple iPhone is they package it with a search warrant and they send it off to Seattle, Washington, to then have Apple perform the forensic imaging, and then Apple sends the data back to us. And one of my questions was to the, an to the analyst or the, the imaging officer was how long does that take? Because time is a lot of time of the, uh, of the essence in these vests. It can be of the essence. Um, it was about three months to get the data returned. Um, now, one of the things he also has to do is he has to ensure that the data he's giving me it conforms to the limitations of the search warrant. Because if we go into a prosecution case and the search warrant, the, the data doesn't conform to the search warrant, that could be a legal issue that we have to face after the fact. Now, uh, collision data recorder, the airbag control module in the vehicle is very helpful uh, for a couple reasons, and I, I mentioned them here, throttle percentage, steering angle and braking status. If you're inattentive or if you're distracted, these are the data, this is the data on the module that is helpful to build your case. Uh, now, what I have here is a photograph of a module that was removed from a vehicle uh, involving a fatality that was then imaged back at our office uh, where we were able to obtain the data off of it. And some of the, uh, the, the information that you're getting in addition, speed is great. I mean, speed is phenomenal. We're able to, if you're able to substantiate the speed through other means of reconstruction, it's a great tool to have. But I'm primarily focused on uh, the distracted part of it and whether or not they applied their brakes. And this information is easily obtainable through the airbag control module download. Now, I also wanted to mention steering angle. And steering angle can be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. For example, if you suspect somebody was distracted and they're going into a crash, you've downloaded this information, you know they were going 50 miles an hour, about 73 feet per second, so you can back them up, back them up, back them up. If you've got 10 seconds of pre-crash data, you can start backing them up on that roadway. You know how far back they were when the steering angle was taking effect. Now, if you have a, 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 some manufacturers are different. If you look at this table in front of you, you see steering input is a three, four, four, one, one, and then you have negative numbers. Now, some manufacturers is positive numbers left, negative is right, and vice versa. With this particular uh, illustration, uh, the negative steering is right, positive is left. What we're trying to establish here is you have a gradual left turn of the steering wheel, uh, basically three degrees from dead center, top dead center, to the left. One second, and then, and then if you have 2.5 seconds before that airbag wakes up, you're starting to get some right steering. And then as you go into one and a half seconds before the crash, you have, you have a negative one, meaning that he's barely, the, the, the steering wheel is barely moving. And then suddenly, a half second before the crash, you have a 14 degree steering angle followed by a 64 degree steering angle. So 
you can then use some of that information on your search warrant or in your investigation to then show just how many seconds leading up to the crash that person was inattentive, uh, which may push it to the criminally negligent level, which can then get that person some jail time uh, and it gets them away from just sending one text message to being five and six, ten seconds in a tenant. Uh, now, search warrant, case, prepara uh, case preparation, and, and these are just some, some topics that you can that you should or need in your search warrants uh, for officers. And then obviously the types of crashes, some of the things we went over earlier, uh, the lack of evidence at, at the scene can be indicative of a distracted driving crash evidence within the vehicle, the cell phone uh, being in the car, and actually some other things too. You can have food, uh, food in the vehicle, kids in the vehicle. Those types of things can be, uh, you know, indications of distracted driving. It's not always completely a cell phone. Uh, the physical location of the cell phone and whether or not the damage is consistent with airbag interaction. Biological evidence on the cell phone. Witness statements, uh, independent who may have witnessed the crash or passengers in the vehicle your cell phone texting records, and your forensic imaging. And last but not least, if you can then correlate all that with your airbag control module data, you can then further that case, hopefully, and also, well, as far as your probable cause for your search warrant, you can then push it to that next level or work towards that direction. Um, in closing, I just wanted to kind of mention that every carrier is, is different uh, as far as what information you can get. And currently, uh, I have Verizon listed at the top. Uh, we have a very good relationship with our law enforcement liaison. And, and some of the information that we currently have is the cell phone. And this is, you know, information that we found out later on when cases go civil. And civil attorneys are able to uh, obtain cell phone records that most of the time they are kept, well, for one rolling year. So from today's date until this date next year this record should still be available to be subpoenaed. Uh, now the texting, as I said, is very volatile, three to five days. That's why you need to get the letter of preservation there immediately. Um, and, and some of the other things as far as the IP session and, and the destination information and pictures, you know, how long they can be available if they're sent to the website and so forth. But once again, these cell phone records are kind of, they're not quite as good for use as an actual imaging of the phone itself. Um, that's about the end of my uh, my presentation, and you know I, I left my uh, my email address up here if anybody would like to copy it down, and and we can discuss you know later on some specifics. Thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. Keep my mic. Okay. Everybody with a cell phone. Everybody with a cell phone.